Praise the Lord, saints. Welcome to St. Timothy Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Deacon Pernell Jones, Jr., and this is our Sunday school time. And our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Elmore Torbert, Jr. Come and visit us one Sunday at 7101 Carnegie Avenue. Again, in that great city, this great city of Cleveland, Ohio. Praise God. Well, saints, as always, we are studying our Sunday school lesson out of our Bible Expositor and Illuminator book. We're in the month of January, January 26th, and we're right in the middle of our three-month lesson uh, on, on living in Christ. We're talking about living new, a, a new life in Christ, a transformed life in Christ, and we're going to discuss that a little further in today's lesson. And our lesson is entitled, God Honoring Families. Again, God Honoring Families. Families. That's an adjective, God-honoring families. And we're coming out of the book of Ephesians. We're still in Ephesians as we've been in the last few weeks. We're now in the fifth chapter. We're going to look at chapter 5 through 6, uh, beginning at verses 21. Again, Ephesians 5, the 21st verse. All right? Well, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. You are a holy God and a righteous God. You are a merciful God and you are a loving God. So, Lord, we trust you in all things, Lord. We thank you for your son who died on the cross for our sins, the blood that was shed and covers each and every believer, Father, and your Holy Spirit that seals us to the day of redemption as we walk through this life in the power of your Holy Spirit, we thank you that the same Holy Spirit will, will seal us to the day where we will one day be with you in heaven. So, Lord, we just thank you this day. Lord, we ask that your word wash over us, cleanse us, and transform us. Fill us and feed us, Father, as you would have. Give us a good time in your word this day, Lord. We thank you, we love you, and we give you all the honor. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. All right, saints, well, let's get started. We're in the book of Ephesians 5.21, and, and, and Paul is, is sharing some challenging information about families and how families, the marital relationship and children, uh, how the, the family dynamic and, and in the marriage in particular, is an image of Christ. It is a portrait of the Christ relationship with his bride, with his church. That's you and me, every believer in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, saints, this gives us insight into what a healthy and godly marriage looks like. All right? Well, let's dig into it, saints. If you're ready, let's read Ephesians 5 and 21. And it reads, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Well, saints, I'm glad our Sunday school lesson starts with this verse because many times you see people don't start there. They start with that verse you know is coming up that says, wives, submit to your husbands, all right? Wives, submit to your husbands. But here I like the way our Sunday school lesson starts us off at a good place so we can get a good understanding of what this truly means in the Lord. So submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. In the earlier verses, it is telling us how the Holy Spirit leads and guides us, how he fills and controls us. So we're not simply following a set of rules. No, it's not some calculus book or some standard operating procedure book. No, the Holy Spirit fills us the way alcohol fills a person. They're both spirits. The world knows that alcohol is a spirit. They both fill us and they control us but they have two different purposes. Oh, you know what it means to have alcohol fill a person. But when the Holy Spirit fills us, oh, you see it because there is a light that, that, that dispels darkness when we are children of light. The, the things of darkness are made apparent and laid bare when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and allow God's light to shine. It, he fills us and produces when we yield and submit to the Holy Spirit. He produces the fruit of the Spirit in us of love and joy and peace, patience, goodness, 
gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith. These are the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. These are the things that are made apparent in our life. And we, and we display these things even through the darkness of sin, through the difficulties of life. We love through a world that may show us hate. We show peace through a world that may be, be, be uh, against us and would war against us. Each one of those fruit are like fruit on a tree. And when the winds of life blow, they stay anchored and rooted. And we are truly like Psalm 1 says, being like a tree when you are meditating in God's word, when you are daydreaming and thinking about everything the preacher said on Sunday or, or what you heard on a TV sermon or, or what you read in scripture for yourself. It is meant to anchor you in God's word and in the Lord himself. And you're planted by a river of water, which is the Holy Spirit himself, that living water that nurtures every verse that has been poured into your heart. Every verse that is like a seed that when watered, it bears a tree. And there's nothing better than that tree when that word is John 3, 16, that that tree is that tree of life. We have a right to this tree. And it comes from believing in God's word and hiding it within our heart, daydreaming and thinking about what God has said to us, not simply studying or memorizing, but genuinely accepting what God says in our heart. Romans 10, 9 and 10 is another excellent verse, salvational verse, that when, that when, when we trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins and that the Father rolled, lifted him up. When we believe these things in our heart and confess them with our mouth, then we know we are saved and we have that tree of life. We have eternal life and the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. Well, saints, we want all those things to fill us and to flow through us. And, and, and the world should see that in each and every believer. Well, saints, these are the same things you need to bring to your relationships, regardless of what relationship it is. It could be a, a job from employer to employee, family dynamics within your church. All of these things, as you grow individually, we were not meant to live this Christian life in a silo. No, we stand firmly side by side, our brothers and sisters in Christ, as one body in Christ. And we are called to submit to one another. All right? Be locked arm in arm. And our lesson, as we dig into this direct verse, it is speaking to the marital relationship. It says, submitting yourselves one to another husband and wives. So I like to start there because husbands are required to submit to their wives as well. You fell in love, you got married, and now you're one body in, you are one flesh, as it tells us in creation in Genesis. Husband and wife become one flesh. You declare it first, but saints, the reality is it takes a little time for the glue to cement itself, doesn't it? You can take two sheets of paper and glue them together. You could pull them right apart right away you know, while it's still wet. But after a while, there should be a cementing to a point where even two sheets of paper with some Elmer's glue in between should not come apart. All right? Well, that's, that takes work. And this verse, these verses today are going to help us with that work. All right? So when you're submitting yourselves as a husband and as a wife, you're submitting to the marital bond that you have chosen to enter into. You're submitting yourself to the marriage so that you are both operating, husband and wife, under the headship of Christ. All right. He is the lead. He is the head. Submission has gotten a dirty word because of the world and because of the way Christians and people unsaved have, have, have been mistreating as husbands, at, have been at times mistreating of their wives, attempting to be dictators and overbearing and every ungodly thing that you could imagine. And it has led to, to a, a misunderstanding of what Scripture truly says. So we want to be able to see the good example and hear it in, in God's Word so that we can have an image of a healthy marriage. So husband and wives, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? 
no different than the child would have a certain fear and respect of their parent. You should have that for your heavenly father as well. I had one. I wouldn't even cross the street on my, my bike, cross the big street when I was a kid, even when my friends would cross the street, because I knew my father didn't allow me to cross the street. They would ride their bikes to the other side and see me sitting on the sidewalk and tell me to come on. And I was like, oh, no. My father said, I can't cross that street. And they said, he's not here. <laughs> that had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> I knew I'd be in trouble. There was a fear that I had that was a genuine respect that caused me to be obedient. And that is what is called here in the fear of the Lord, this submission, this attitude of submissiveness, slightly different than obedience, tied together. And we're going to talk about the difference as well because children are called to be obedient. And the wife is not called to this level that the children are called to the parent. But submission is an attitude. So let's take a moment and let's talk about the word submission. Submit. It means to yield. All right. It does not mean you are submitting to someone who is a superior. No, because that might not be the case. Your wife might be smarter than you. <laughs> she might make a little more money than you. All right. A whole lot of things that, that that you might look at and say uh, on the super on the surface that you may appear to feel uh, that she may have more, but that is not the point. The point submission here. Let, let's let's describe submission submitting in in terms of our rules of the road traffic. All right. We all understand the commandments of the road. The stop when we come to a stoplight. There are three commands on the stoplight: red, yellow, and green. That means stop, slow down, or go. And if we do not follow these commands to the letter, then there's opportunity for danger, opportunity for collisions, opportunity for loss of life. So we should obey the three commands of the road. When you see a red light, you stop. When you see when it turns yellow, you need to slow down, not speed up, but slow down. And when you see the green light, you should go. But saints, just like in the Bible, the Bible has commands too, 10 commandments and many other commands. But there are greater commandments, even in the ones we've talked about in the Bible. There are greater commandments on the road, on the tra in traffic uh, uh, rules. In fact, let's say, what is that greater rule in the traffic? When you come to a red light, red, yellow, and green, what is greater than those three laws on the road? Well, here's an example. It is when a fire truck comes down in the opposite direction. You are sitting at your red light. Your light turns green. You have the right to go. But then a fire engine comes by. Its siren is going. It is about to pass in front of you, and you've got the right to go. Well, now there is a greater command that is at play right here. And this greater command requires yielding. It requires that you stop at, at a green light as if it were red. You must stop so that this fire truck might come by. And it's not because the fire truck is bigger than your car, which it probably is. It's not because it's moving faster than you, which it certainly is if you're sitting still. But it is because this fire truck is moving forward across your path to save the life of those who may be dying in the fire. And without your willingness to yield your right to go, then you hinder the, the, the saving of the life of those who may be dying in a fire. You are entering into an agreement by submitting. You are partnering with those on the road, your fellow drivers, those in the fire truck, those that are in the home that are potentially dying in the fire. By you submitting your rightful law to go, right to go, you are now operating at a greater law at a greater law, which is submission, loving submission. You are showing love to those who may be dying in a fire. And by yielding, the fire truck goes by safely. It does not get by safely if you exercise your right to go. Well, saints, it is no different in the word of God. Leviticus 19.18 and Deuteronomy 6.5 they both say, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength. And the other says, love thy neighbor as thyself. We are called to love God and to love our neighbors, those in the fire truck, those in the, in the house in the fire, those in the traffic, our spouses, our children, 
our, our employers, our employees, we are called to love one another in such a way and use these higher loves, these greater loves in Scripture, loving the Lord and loving our neighbor. And we do this through those fruit. We do those through the words by operating in words like submission, forgiveness. Oh, there are many more we can go through, but we're going to focus on submit today. The beauty and acceptability of the word submission. It is an attitude within each and every person. And our lesson today starts off by telling us it is for the husband and the wife alike. You are both to submit yourselves one to another. And if you do this, then you, you have an opportunity to save souls, okay? to be a blessing to one another, to be a saving, saving force for one another, healing and, and strengthening one another, Caring all that the giving all that the Holy Spirit desires to produce in each and every one of you in a marital relationship, but it does require looking at God's laws and saying there is even a greater law that God gives us that we should be operating in. We should be painting in our portrait. We should be painting with the oils and paints of God's fruit. Galatians 5, and 23 tells us what those fruit of the Spirit are, of meekness and, 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 and peace and love and faith. It says, against such there is no law. There are no commandments against these greater laws. Okay, There are no red light, red, yellow, green, stop, slow down laws that can deny or hinder in any way the fruit of God's Spirit, this love. And it is an agape love. It is not the love between two friends. That is a phileo, a Greek word phileo, where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It is not that type of love. Agape is not that type of love. Agape is not the marital love of eros, the Greek word for erotic, a marital love. Those are important loves, and they will be there when you're, when you're ready to get married. But as a husband, you are called to love your wife with an agape love. It is a woeful love that regardless of the circumstances, your love doesn't change. Your sacrificial attitude towards your spouse does not change. Over time, you are to willfully continue to show that love, even as you have that erotic love for your spouse, the marital love for your spouse. God is calling you to a sacrificial love to your spouse that will engender a, a, a spirit of feeling of safety for your spouse. And, and you will enter into a, I'm going to call it a tango. As you show love to her, she will show respect to you. Okay? She is called to do that in God's word as well. Okay? And it is a, it is a give and take, a, a marital tango that will take place that you are to nurture and to develop over time, and the oneness will grow. So submit yourselves one to another with the respect, with the fear of the Lord, with that type of respect. Wives, in verse 22, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You all submit to the Lord. That is why a man cannot be a dictator because if he's calling a wife to do something ungodly, she has, she has every right to say, I am not going to sin for you. I don't care how much I love you. I'm not going to sin against my God because you have said so. Okay, So this tango requires a partnership here, husband and wife, to work. Husband, love your wives, and wives, submit to your husband. If there was danger coming, if there was a husband, a wife, and a child walking down the street, and then a, 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 a thief comes and pulls out a knife, well, you know what? Here's what, what, what should happen. The, the, the wife may cling, to, cling the child in her arms close to her. The husband might put his hand out, put his wife behind him. Now you got to be behind your husband. My goodness, behind your husband. But it's there for a purpose because he's going to stand and be self-sacrificing and, and protect the family unit from a danger. All right? This is what the Spirit is speaking to. He's saying there is a unity and a, and a and an organizational structure 
that I created not to give someone a chance, opportunity to, to be a boss, but to be a leader, right? To be one who encourages and strengthens his family and not drains and, and dictates to them and, 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 and disparages them or, 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 or makes them frustrated in any way. No, that is not the purpose. It is meant to strengthen the family, grow the family, and to be an image of the relationship that Christ has to his bride, to his church. So wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I'm going to give you another example, the biblical example in, in, in the garden, Adam and Eve. God, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they sinned in the garden and God addressed them, he said some words that we've all heard, but they can be pretty challenging, but we're going to, to, to um, uh, break them down here for a moment. In the garden, God said to Adam and Eve, and, and he said, uh, let, let me find the verse 3, Genesis 3, 16. He said, I will put an animosity or enmity between the serpent and the woman, between her descendants and your descendants, serpent. They shall bruise your head. Her descendants shall bruise your head, serpent. And serpent, you shall bruise the heel of this woman's child one day. Unto the woman, he said, and here's the point. He said, I will greatly multiply the sorrow, uh, thy sorrow in thy conception. Uh, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That is, again, the King James Version. The part I want to focus on is where God says to Eve, after all that is done, he says, and Eve, and thy desire, Eve, shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Well, well what does that mean? Because Eve has sinned, here's what it doesn't mean. Eve, because you ate from the tree just like he did, now whatever your husband tell you to do, you're going to do it, and that's going to keep you out of trouble in the future. That is not what it is saying. That is not what the verse says. Here's what it means. It says, Eve, thy desire, he says, thy desire shall be to thy husband. So here's what that means. The Eve has, like any human being, but we're talking about Eve, she, she has desires. Good and bad, godly and ungodly, okay? We all have desires, but we're talking about Eve right now. Good and bad. And they will be to the, your, and thy desire shall be to your husband. What that means is it, it was just played out. God is repeating and stating what has just happened. Eve had a desire. It happened to be an ungodly one. She spoke to the serpent, and the serpent said, eat from this tree. She knew what the word says, but in her own words, she was beguiled. He deceived her, and now she desired to eat from the tree of which God has said, don't eat. Though She had a desire, and her desire was to her husband. Once she wanted to eat, she convinced him that he wanted to eat. Her desire was now imprinted and transferred onto him. She wanted to eat, now he wants to eat. She was beguiled in her own words or deceived. Adam was not deceived. Adam knew it was wrong. But when that, when that woman came up to him and said, you should have a little bit of this fruit, she, he decided he was going to have a little bit. It didn't matter what God had said. And that was his sin. He did it out of disobedience. She did it out of being beguiled in her own words. And God is simply stating that. Again, he said, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, hard King James language, but what he's really saying is to Adam, Adam, you should not be disobedient. Just because you were asked to sin, even by your wife, you need to make a, a, a football coaching call. You need to rule over. When she said eat, you should have said, no, we're not going to eat. Take that fruit and roll it back up under that tree. Didn't eat. Didn't say don't touch. Said don't eat. Said take it in. Since she had it in her hand, take it, roll it back in that tree and keep the family moving along. This has nothing to do with a man being a dictator or a king or a ruler over the wife. No, he was called to be responsible for his wife and for their family, and he didn't do it. He sinned. He knew it was wrong. He knew what God said, and he chose to do what he wanted to do. Well, that's true for everyone, husbands, wives, people in general. God says do something, and we decide we want to do what we want to do. But in the marital relationship, God is saying, be obedient to me, both of you. 
Submit yourselves to one another in the fear of me. Respect what I say to you because my word, God is saying, my word is life. My word is freedom. My word, my word will pre- create a fellowship in your marital relationship that you just can't buy. Oh, when you find a wife, you find better than money, saints. All right. Well, saints, we're going to keep on reading. For, for the husband is the head of the wife. He is called to be responsible, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be their own husbands, be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Christ was sacrificed for his church. Why should the husband not be as willing to be sacrificial for his spouse? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Christ wants to present the body of baptized believers, a glorious church, and he wants to present it to himself one day in heaven, not having spot, wrinkle, or blemish, or such things, but that it would be holy and, again, without blemish. Saints, these three things, spots, wrinkles, and blemishes, come from three different sources. A spot is a mark like mud or ketchup or mustard. It's an external source for this thing that mars the beauty of the relationship between the church and Christ between the husband and the wife, when there are outside external forces that make your marital relationship ugly or or dirty, outside sources, you must resist those. A blemish is equally as tarnishing to the beauty of the marriage or to the individual believer. It is equally as damaging, but its source is internal. A blemish comes from the inside. And a wrinkle equally is, is, is harming to the beauty of what God has given us in a marital relationship. But it comes from over time. Things become decayed. They, they become corrupt. Governments can become corrupt over time. CDs can be corrupt over time with scratches. And, and, and time is what a wrinkle speaks to, things that happen over time. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, He that loveth his wife loveth himself. We care for ourselves. We feed ourselves. We clean ourselves. We should have an equal love for our spouses. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, nor but nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife sees that she reverences her husband. Children, let's shift our conversation. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children are meant to obey which is stronger than the submissive attitude, although it is built into for children as well. Children should obey. They should be given structure, and they will learn. They should not be frustrated or or disparaged. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nature and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, we don't want to provoke. I'm going to put some verses, a poem on the screen that you can see and you can scroll through at any time. Scroll it for me a little bit there, Reverend Producer. (laughs) If children live with criticism, they learn to condemn. So, fathers, these are, are powerful notes to think about. Children learn what they live. So if a child lives with criticism, they learn to condemn. If they live with hostility, they learn to fight. If they live with ridicule, they learn to be shy. If they live with shame, they learn to feel guilt. If they live with tolerance, they learn to be patient. If they live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If they live with praise, they learn to appreciate. 
If they live with fairness, they learn justice. If they live with security, they learn to have faith. And if they live with approval, they learn to like themselves. And if they live with acceptance and friendship, they learn to find love in the world. Well, saints, that's our lesson for this week. Come on back next week as we continue to live transformed lives in Christ.